Welcome to Imperfect Momming. Our children are constantly looking to us for examples. The term role model doesn't quite cut it here. We are shaping their worldview with every move we make. You see, it's not in the lectures we give or moments where we are actively attempting to teach them. It's in the micro movements we make, the unconscious ways in which we navigate life. We are constantly teaching our children how to show up for themselves, their friends, their future partners, and even their future children. So what can we do to ensure we are raising thoughtful, compassionate, self-aware human beings? We have to become them ourselves. No one is perfect, but we can still all be better, and it starts with self-healing. Let's get to it. Welcome back to Imperfect Momming, and we have a very special guest today, uh, Maria. Welcome to Imperfect Momming. Oh, thank you for having me here, Lisa. I'm very excited to be here. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, so my name is Maria Yakimchuk, and I am a transformational EFT coach for moms. I specialize in moms who are struggling to find joy and fulfillment in motherhood mostly due to uh, postpartum depression and anxiety, but also due to childhood traumas and generational traumas. And I know a lot of us have that in our past, so that almost encompasses all the moms, but that is basically the people I specialize in helping. Awesome. I, I'm very fascinated with the generational trauma, which I'm sure the listeners have picked up on <laughs> really, really interested in generational trauma but I know that postpartum depression and even postpartum anxiety really aren't things that um, get talked about a whole lot um, I think de postpartum depression comes is talked about a lot more but the postpartum anxiety is something that I only first heard of through uh, a family member of mine after she had um, her first baby and um, I know we were all just kind of like, why, what is, what is happening here? Why are you like so obsessing on the sleep schedule? But I don't think anybody like really talked to her about it. Um, and it's been a while since I asked her about it. So I don't remember all of her details, but, um, is there something that, that comes up a lot with you, with your clients that, is it always kind of hindsight or is it something that you are like, have you gotten checked for postpartum anxiety or like, how do you, how does that come up in your, with your clients? Yeah. So anxiety is actually probably even more common than depression because I mean, anxiety, especially post pandemic has become one of the most commonly diagnosed things in all of the population. Postpartum anxiety is a little bit different than regular anxiety because it does concentrate a bit more on like the baby and they mm -hmm. are these obsessive thoughts. So yeah, something like uh, obsessing over a sleep schedule would definitely be one of those. You know, if you're one of those moms who I can't sleep because I'm worried my baby's going to stop breathing. So I'm going to stand on the whole night. That definitely usually a red flag for postpartum anxiety. If you're having a lot of intrusive thoughts, like, oh, if I carry the baby down the stairs, we're going to fall and the baby's going to hit its head, blood's going to splatter, like things like that. Or I'm going to impale the baby on like a corner of a furniture and things like that. Those are intrusive thoughts that are part of it, uh, postpartum anxiety. Yeah. Um, you could also have like more typical, like physical symptoms of anxiety, which is like heart palpitations, nausea. Um, you can have a panic attack, obviously, and you could be irritable which is one of those that it could actually happen in both postpartum depression and anxiety in postpartum depression it usually isn't just irritability it's more rage we associate with postpartum depression with postpartum anxiety we have more irritability less rage but both still could have you basically yelling at the kids being like I can't be touched like don't be near me all the noises are setting me off that could be something as part of anxiety. So yeah, there, there are definitely red flags along the way. It doesn't have to be something that you look back on and say that, oh, I had postpartum anxiety. But the problem is like a lot of us don't come in armed with the information. Like for example, I had no idea I had postpartum anxiety myself because no one actually told me about what symptoms to watch out for. And I was like, well, having postpartum depression symptoms and they're 
And then there's some other weird ones that don't quite fit. Like, what are they? And it took me a while to be like, oh, well, that's anxiety. But I've never, like my OB, nobody ever informed me that those are things to watch out for. And I remember pre-child <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, postpartum depression was, you only heard about extremes, like where postpartum depression was where you actually wanted to harm your baby and that I actually see haven't heard of that at all recently since in the last 10 years to be honest like it hasn't been something that I've been in tune with but it's funny that you said that having the anxiety is like fearing like you're gonna fall down the stairs Mm -hmm. because I my son was six months old and I slipped on the last three steps And, um, you know, Maria might be thinking how coordinated is Alicia because she just (laughs) fell down the stairs right now before we logged on to this call. And, um, I am, I swear it doesn't happen very often, but, um, the, the, the fear that I felt the emotions that I felt after slipping on the last three steps, holding my son at six months triggered a lot of brought up a lot of emotions that I wasn't aware of and I think I had heard something along the lines of like postpartum depression can take six months to show up Mm -hmm. and so I actually thought that I didn't have or that I wasn't that I had postpartum depression that whole time and I just wasn't aware of it but ever since I heard that I was like oh well maybe I just maybe it just started like in that six month range. Cause we were going to my son's six month appointment when I slipped down the stairs and then went to the doctor appointment, you know, without his dad and when, when he could have come and, and, um, and there was a question on the doctor's um, form that said, do you feel like you're getting the support that you need? And I checked yes. When I, when I wanted to check no, but I was afraid of what would happen if I checked no. And, you know, and that, uh, that a lot happened, you know, if you want to know my story, you can listen to the first episode of the podcast, but like, that's kind of where it all lined up for me. But you mentioned that, you know, your OB didn't tell you about the signs to look out for. My experience with my OB was we got checked at three days, I think three days postpartum and then six weeks postpartum, and then you're done. And it's like, there's so much more. Apparently we can have postpartum depression up to, you know, starting at six months postpartum, like, (laughs) sorry, I'm rambling, but (laughs) no, but it's true. Right. Like, and that's the kind of information can we like women don't get. And it's, you know, one thing, if you are, you have the background in that and you can go and you can look it up and, or you have resources, like you have people who with that same background or your friends and you can ask them, but your average mom doesn't necessarily have the bandwidth to go and research postpartum depression because she's in the midst of caring for a baby. We're trying to learn what we're doing. We're trying not to kill it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that's why our doctors should be informing us of that. And the, the truth is that the DSM, which is the, diagno- uh, the diagnostic manual for mental health, um, doesn't actually, has like a very short period in which you're allowed sort of to have postpartum depression. It's usually somewhere between two weeks and I think three months. It doesn't even like extend it to six months. But in reality, what we have seen in practice is that it can happen up to a year or 18 months after. Like, our, for some reason, our medical profession treats our postpartum period as being like super short, but really our postpartum period is the rest of our lives after we have the baby. And for a lot of women, like you wouldn't, maybe if you were doing it for insurance purposes, classify someone's postpartum depression as postpartum depression, because insurance will be like, nope, doesn't fit the criteria. But if you're sitting across from them, you'll be like, yep, this definitely has to do with postpartum. This is not just depression or just anxiety that's coming up. But unfortunately, the medical profession doesn't necessarily recognize that and doesn't inform the moms and doesn't give the moms the information that's needed to be able to have the support, right? And it's sort of not funny, but the fact that you mentioned that you were worried about marking off that I don't have any support, I 
it's a story of so many moms of when you mark off things that you're not actually feeling because you're scared of what the repercussions are because we've all read those horror stories where the mom admitted that she has postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety and the baby gets taken away right Right. like you weren't offered support right it's not like they're going to come in and be like oh okay so you marked you have no support so here are things that you could do or like here's organizations or people no it could be like oh okay we're going to call cps and it's like that's not helpful at all and so we hide it right i was the perfect patient who kept marking off like i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine came in with a smile everything's great and then went home and cried my eyes out because i don't want to tell the doctor because i also i was worried like what are they going to do if i tell them the truth it, it's scary yeah and i know for for me looking back i wasn't aware of most of this but you know i had a story where i didn't want people to know that i wasn't perfect like i wanted yeah. people to think that i that i was perfect that i had this perfect family and i had you know that i just it just growing up like a pastor's as a pastor's kid like i wanted everyone to everyone kind of expected perfection out of me like there's these two um buckets that you can fit into as a pastor's child kid like you're either a perfect angel or you're the devil child and I I was not the devil child and I knew I wasn't perfect but I was like I don't want to be that so I need to at least aspire to and make people believe that I'm this right and so that's where it was coming from for me but I can understand that perspective too like what if they take my baby away from me and I would never have said that I had postpartum depression because of what I thought postpartum depression was and that it means that you want to kill your kid or like hurt them or or some or you don't care about them I like Mm -hmm. I don't even remember all of the things that I thought that postpartum depression was but it's interesting that you say that our postpartum period can go up to even 18 months Because it at least takes six months for your body to regulate hormonally. Like there's so much that goes on into our body hormonally during pregnancy that it has to regulate itself back to. But I imagine that the hormones continue for maybe even as long as you breastfeed. Uh, And even longer. I mean, like this was very anecdotal because I have some uh, friends who are in the more like functional medicine uh, professions and uh, my friend who is a functional medicine doctor she she said that in reality the postpartum period in terms of the reg- hormonal regulation usually takes between for most women between 18 months and two and a half years oh. but, but your regular medical profession doesn't say it. it's like you have your six month checkup and if you're good to go for sexual activity good you're great even though your hormones are nowhere near where they're supposed to be like your body <laughs> is in a complete disarray, right? Like you just grew a whole human, the organs rearranged, you pushed out the human, now organs are rearranging again. There's like so much hormonally happening, but we don't recognize that we're like, oh yeah, you should be fine, but it's not. You're able to have sex now, you're good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, supposedly, right? Supposedly physically you're able to help (laughs) to have sex, right? No one actually asked you, are you able to, right? So it's, it's, it's a hard thing, right? Like we just, we don't get the support we need and we're scared to ask for the support because you could be penalized for asking for that support. And And our culture doesn't really, you know, this, that this concept of being super mom where I have to do it all myself, like we've bred this into our culture. So not only is there necessarily the fear that the child will get taken away because we're not do because we're not supported and we're not doing our job. But we're even if that's not the fear, we're supposed to be able to do it all. Like I'm a woman, I birthed a child, I'm supposed to be able to do it all. Like that's what our society tells us yeah. that we're supposed to do. And it's just it's it's so backwards from how we've evolved in other cultures like other cultures i talk about this book a lot even though i haven't actually finished reading it but it's called hunt gather parent Mm -hmm. and it talks about how other cultures uh raise their children in a community with you know it takes a it takes a village to raise a child right so there's i think that there's that pressure that we put on ourselves from this external society 
and then watching our moms do it all by ourselves by themselves and so on and so forth oh for sure and i think that that is one of the main drivers for depression and anxiety postpartum because we're not meant to do it alone we are meant to do it supported and it comes up safe and we don't feel safe because we don't have the support being like i have to do everything by myself even though I'm falling apart, but who cares about that? But I have to be able to do it. But, and again, that's all societal messaging, right? Like you hear it and for some reason it gets stored in your mind. And then once you become a mom, it all just comes flooding out of you. And then you're like, yep, I'm failing. But then it's like, no, you're not. You were never meant to be doing all of it. Yeah. I, I have this, this theory about hormones that... <laughs> hormones actually get kind of a bad rap where we blame our feelings on our hormones when what my theory is and what I believe is that those feelings always existed. Your hormones don't create the feelings. The feelings have existed, but, you know, during that cycle of, of the month or during your pregnancy, the wall that you have built up that hides those feelings is not as strong and so the feelings are leaking out here and there mm-hmm. and so these feelings that you've been holding on to for so long are being released because the hormones are present and weakening the wall but they've all they've always been there so as i started expressing my emotions more frequently because I I was a holder of emotions like the rest of us. <laughs> so I experienced the mood swings. I was like, oh yeah, oh, oh, that makes so much sense why I was crying yesterday because I'm, you know, I'm getting my I started my period today. Right. I was one of those people too. And then as I started expressing more of how I was feeling in the moment instead of suppressing things, I started realizing like oh, my, my period had just happened. I had no indication that it was coming whatsoever. There was no emotional warning that it was showing, going to show up. It just showed up. And it's like, oh, that's so interesting. (laughs) And the first reason that I had thought of this, and I guess there's a book about it that I don't remember the name of, but, um, a, a friend of mine asked me if I felt like my if I had fears with all the hormones of pregnancy, if I had fears that my husband was going to cheat on me or that he was cheating on me. Hmm. And I thought, well, no, because I don't feel that way normally. Mm -hmm. So it's like the hormones aren't going to create that, you know, it's just, it was such a weird question in that moment that just made me think a little bit deeper about it. Yeah. I mean, it could be right. I, been following like a bunch of people on Instagram and there's somebody I was following who was talking about syncing your life essentially to your cycle that like you know our life in general is on this 24-hour cycle which is more geared towards men but it's completely inappropriate for women because we do live on our lunar cycle and she actually brought something up that I never thought about she was like that we are all meant to believe that the way that we are in our period is overly emotional and out of whack and all that. And that's not how we actually are. And she said, but that's not true. In reality, that when we are in our period and consequently probably pregnancy and postpartum is when our intuition is at its highest. And those are actually our true feelings. And I yeah. think that sort of goes along with what you're saying hormonally. Like, I think actually like our intuition, our inner self is a lot more open when we're either menstruating, we're pregnant or or postpartum. And yeah, I think a lot of fears come up. I mean, there's also trauma involved. There's just so much involved in like what's happening with the birth and like the identity shift, like motherhood is so complex that we try to treat it like, oh, cool. You push the baby out. Okay. Go back to work. (laughs) Within six weeks, by the way. Well, Um. (laughs) if you're lucky, right? Because for some people it's like, well, you got no maternity leave. Like, you know, go back home yesterday like I don't care that you had a baby right but other countries don't have that but here we treat it like yeah you if you're a mom basically don't let anybody else see that you're a mom yeah oh yeah like I I I learned you know I've been I've for the most part I've been an entrepreneur since before my son was born but I've gone back to work a couple of times throughout his life and I learned in the first probably round or two of interview processes don't mention that you're a mom Mm because they're they don't, they don't want 
you. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> because most of my sick days are used because I'm a mom, not because I'm sick. And it's, it, they just don't want to be bothered with it. And I could be completely off base with that just from my experience that felt like it. I do like that you brought in the intuition side of the hormonal cycle and the, the, the cycle that we're on our, our female bodies are on that the, I, I think that's beautiful. Cause I, the more that I've been getting into this per, into personal development, the more I notice in hindsight, my intuition. Mm-hmm. And what I want to do is start listening to it before. And instead of saying, you know, and maybe, and I probably do, I just don't recognize those because the intuition, I followed it. And then I didn't get bit in the butt because I didn't (laughs) follow it. Like this weekend, we went to, um, we went to a lake nearby in, in our motor home. And I remember asking on Friday, should I drive my car? Because when you're in the motor home, it's harder to go to dinner. If you're in the motor home, you know, it's like, there's hard, it's harder to find places to park. And so I thought, should I bring my car so that we can move around more easily? And we decided against taking the car. And when we pulled out of the driveway of our house, we noticed that the air conditioning was broken in the motor home and it's was over a hundred degrees all weekend. And if you've ever traveled in a motor home without air conditioning, it's like living in an oven for however long that you're in the car. (laughs) And it was like, I, yesterday I spent 90% of the time that I was in the motor home, I was miserable. And I'd step outside and I was like, Oh, I can be Mm. free. And, and there's air, like, it's crazy. It's a hundred some degrees. And this hundred some degrees feels better outside (laughs) than inside. Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, I think about it after the fact, like that was my intuition saying I should bring the car because we don't have any air conditioning. Yeah. And that could have been right. Like we, and we're taught not to listen to our intuition as like people like, I feel like women are naturally more intuitive than men, but everybody has capabilities to be intuitive. We are just it's all about listening, but a lot of us are taught not to listen and ignore it. And then we wonder why we grow up and we feel so out of alignment. And that's sort of part of the work that I'm doing with my moms is sort of helping them get back into the alignment and to quiet all that other noise, all the societal noise, all the expectations, all the crap that has been layered on us from generations past, from our own childhood, from just everything we receive around and basically let, tuning into ourselves and listening to ourselves and being like, what am I hearing from within me? Because I actually have wisdom within me, but I don't listen to it because society has told me from when I was like this big to be like, don't listen to yourself, listen to us. But we know that at the end, that doesn't work. That's how we end up unhappy, depressed, anxious, you name it. Yeah. Cause I think we get into a little bit of a people pleasing cycle too. And that, you know, we have our intuition. And then there's the, I also want everybody around me to be happy kind of a feeling. And that I experienced that this weekend too, where it was like, we went to a little play place with my son and, and our camping partner's daughter where we, you know, we went that way. And, um, my boyfriend and my son rode their bikes down the hill And I knew that coming up that hill was going to be rough and, but I didn't want to be left behind. I wanted to, you know, go with them too. And, and, um, and then on the way back, the, the dad of the little girl said, do we want to go the, on the hill or do we want to go the shortcut? And I was like, shortcut, there's a Mm. shortcut. What? (laughs) Well, tell me more about the shortcut. And I, I knew in that moment, I wanted to go the shortcut that it was a better idea. And, but I turned to my, my boyfriend and I said, the shortcut sounds like a good idea, right? Like, (laughs) like I needed his permission to go on the shortcut. And obviously I didn't, it was just like in that moment, I didn't want to disappoint him because we had talked about me walking back up the hill with them, you know? And, um, I don't know, just funny little stories of (laughs) how we do that, how we do life. 
Yeah, but our life is full of it, right? It's all those little moments that make up our life and make it up and whether we're happy or sad. But yeah, the people pleasing is so prevalent and women especially because we're just sort of groomed for it from the moment we're born and that we're supposed to care about everybody else around us except ourselves. Again, another reason why moms are in a deep hole because we're always told we need to care for everyone else and not ourselves, which is also not true. And I love the trend that I'm seeing and maybe I'm just seeing it because I'm in the trend, (laughs) but (laughs) I do see more people talking about taking care of yourself and being, and, and filling your needs is not selfish that, you know, we have to fill our own cup and give from the overflow. And that's probably one of my favorite concepts is if you're constantly filling your cup, then you can give from the overflow instead of you know, being half empty and just give and give and give and give until there's nothing left. And that, I remember hearing Rachel Hollis say that on her, um, on the movie that she did right before, I think the, her second book came out and it was, it was really impactful to hear that because we, I, I know I wasn't prioritizing self-care at the time. And I think that hit me as hard as it did because I knew I should be. Yeah, well, and I think that's the story of a lot of moms. But yeah, it is good that there are more people changing the conversation and talking about the fact that like, we have to care about our moms and moms themselves need to start to believe that they're important. They're no Mm -hmm. less important than everybody else in the family and they deserve to have their needs met. And here's the beautiful thing that happens is that um, I come from a marriage and family therapy background. And so we learned about family systems. That is basically how we, uh, how we learn to do our therapy. And the thing is about a system is if even one peg is out of place, the whole system is broken. And so it yeah. literally takes one person to go back into place to put the system back together. But uh, that was, you know, I learned that pre-motherhood. I think after motherhood, I have realized a different thing but yes there's this system and it literally does take only one person to go back into the place but the mom is essentially the heart and soul of that system and if you don't have her being in the right place like it is incredibly hard to put that system back together and I think moms need to remember that you are so important to that system that when you take care of yourself first your kids benefit way more than when you are spending too much energy on them and not any on yourself like because they're not getting the good version of you. They're getting the wiped out, burnt out version of you that's going to eventually yell. It's going to eventually just break down. You don't want to do that. You want to, you also want to show them that like there's a better thing to life. Life isn't all about grinding. Life isn't all about serving everybody. Like have fun. And then your kids join in and have fun with you too. And then you're like, this is actually enjoyable. Motherhood can be enjoyable. Who would have thought, right? I know I'm a boy mom because when you said grinding, I immediately thought of like Minecraft. <laughs> it's like, mine, that's the only place. There yet. I'm a that's boy the mom only too. place we should be grinding is in Minecraft. <laughs> Minecraft. Yeah, we're not there yet. Mine are too little for that. We're, we're still not in that territory, but it's probably coming. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I saw a meme the other the other day that my friend posted and I, I want to just find it and read it because it was so funny um hopefully it was like the last thing she posted and not you know several things down the line so boy mom my friend asked me what it's like to live in a house full of boys which by the way my house is full of boys same, I don't same. there I'm the only female yep same yep house. Same. Even our dog is a boy, so yeah. Yep. Dogs, cats, <laughs> son, boyfriend. Uh, what's it like to live in a house of boys? So I peed on her bathroom floor, ate everything in her fridge, told her 800 stories about Minecraft, farted 20 times, and when she was ready to kill me, I gave her a hug and told her she was pretty. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's about right. <laughs> I said, she goes, I'm not there yet. And I said, it's coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not in the Minecraft stage, but all the other stuff is definitely very, uh, very true. <laughs> so funny. Is there a piece of advice that you want to share with moms? Um, I think my piece of advice is take it like one minute at a time. Uh, the way I even started sort of prioritizing myself is I read this, I ordered this book on Amazon called Breathe Mama Breathe 
mm. by um, I looked it up. What was her name? Shonda Morales, I believe. Yeah, Shonda Morales. She is a well, I can't remember. She's a social worker. She's also uh, an MFT, but she's in the mental health sphere. And she wrote this wonderful book. It's short. It's about doing five minute mindfulness exercises for moms. And they're not even exercises. They're, it's all about taking five minutes to experience whatever you're doing, like mindful cooking, mindful drinking of coffee, like mindful going to the bathroom for crying out loud. Like that is the whole book is all about that because I was like, I really want, I need to get into meditation and all of that. And I'm like, but I don't have time for that. And then I came across that book and I was like, but I have, I always do these things and I can't spend five minutes actually enjoying them. And once I started integrating that into my life, everything else sort of started flowing. Like I started getting deeper into mindfulness. I started getting deeper into, you know, learning about intuition. That's how I sort of came across EFT and emotional freedom. All of it, it just like opened me up, but I still practice all of it at the base of like, I don't have to spend hours on it. All I have to do is spend five minutes. And mm -hmm. I have five minutes somewhere in my day to be mindful. Like I can sit and sip that cup of coffee, even if my kids are doing something else and just enjoy it. And I can even turn on the TV for them for five minutes and that's okay. And like, if that's my moment of peace, that's cool. Like I can do this, no one's dying from it. So that's been my biggest change and my biggest piece of advice to moms is like, don't look at self-care as a big thing you have to do. Just incorporate it into your day. You're already doing these activities, but what if you actually pay attention to them? And once you do, you all of a sudden start realizing my life is actually much brighter and better than I ever gave it credit for, even in sort of the darkest days, because you can come out outside for five minutes and smell the fresh air or, you know, eat a yummy tomato, whatever sort of like, you know, floats your boat, but you have five minutes to do it. And that's what I try to preach is that five minutes at a time, you're going to be able to improve your life. Yeah, I, th I, I love that so much. And because I'm even thinking you know, part of the reason that I slipped down the stairs was because I wasn't fully present to what I was doing. I was thinking about what was coming next and, and what had been coming before. And am I going to be, you know, am I going to have feel nauseous throughout this recording mm -hmm. or am I going to be, you know, able to be present? And it, because I was not thinking about walking down the steps, I missed it. <laughs> yeah. And that happens with everybody, right? Like we all do kind of like silly things because we're not in the present. We're all on autopilot, right? Like our life in the US, especially set up for us to be on autopilot and we have to actively dig our way out of it. Like we have to bring mind to the table and again like mindfulness does not mean you have to sit in a quiet corner with a quiet mind like if that doesn't work for you don't do it like it is not about that I don't do that like it just doesn't work for me like for me mindfulness is doing a couple of stretches in yoga because I'm moving I'm not my mind is clear just because I'm focusing on what I'm doing I used to before having kids we used to ride horses that, that was a mind mindful activity because there's no way you can pay attention to anything else besides what you're doing on the horse because if you are you're going to be on the ground and if we approached our life in general like that we would stay upright a lot more but if we're also not taught that because we're taught to constantly be looking like what is the next step what are we doing where are we rushing to and like we keep uh having our life like that and then you kind of turn back and look around and be like well, what have I been doing with my time? Why have I not enjoyed any of it? I think that's probably my my biggest frustration when you know people are asking what I'm up to. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember anything that I've done recently <laughs> at all. <laughs> I have a friend I haven't talked to her in probably two or three weeks, and and she's like, So what's going on? I was like, I I don't babies in the but I don't other than that, I don't know. <laughs> And I have been doing other things. I just have no awareness of them because I'm not mindful in what I'm doing. And I'm very consumed by uh, this pregnancy in a way that I have was never consumed in any other pregnancy. This one, I had a friend tell me before I even got pregnant that this would be the, this pregnancy would be different than any other pregnancy I've experienced. 
And I couldn't even imagine how that could be true because I've had pretty interesting, (laughs) eventful pregnancies. I was like, I've experienced everything. How could this one be different? Silly, silly me. (laughs) It's very different. I talk about mindfulness it's not always that like you know I'm mindful every single second of the day and that I don't have times where I look back at my week and be like what what happened because you know life with kids is unpredictable like they are they're all characters they all have a lot of needs and sometimes we do rush through but it is important that when you can to take those moments and to really appreciate it and not rush through and and another part about mindfulness is it does teach you not to be perfect which i struggle with that too for me perfection is very important so you know that's again anxiety depression comes from a lot of that as well having to be perfect and i've been working very hard to sort of break that with my mindfulness and being like well i'm not doing anything special I am just outside breathing in the warm summer air that's it that's all I'm doing and how wonderful is that and being able to allow yourself days like that is so great because then you know I might have another day where I have a client on top of client and then I have to do shopping and then I have to go pick up the kids and then I have to bring the kids back and you know entertain them then I have to do dinner like you know there's days like that too but then you balance them out the best you can like the whole point of mindfulness is that it teaches you that the best you can do is good enough. And that's the most important thing. I love that. And you've already told us your book. So where can our listeners find you? Yeah. So I have a website. It's called uh, parentsonboard.com. You can also find me on Instagram, Parents on Board Coaching, and Facebook, Parents on Board Coaching. I, you know, try to post a few times a week with some educational and inspirational content. And on my website, you can find out more about EFT and more about the coaching packages I offer. And I do offer some free introductory packages for people to learn about EFT because I know it's not something a lot of people know about, but it is powerful and it is amazing. So I want, I want to allow people to experience that before committing to it. So yeah, that's where I usually hang out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your conversation and um, your patience with me in general and technology. Oh, yes. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I was very excited to be here. Absolutely. So there will be another episode of Imperfect Momming for you all next week. And until then, keep healing. Bye, guys. Thank you for tuning in to Imperfect Momming. It's time for us to step up and realize that our power is not in trying to shape our children. Our power lies in shaping ourselves into the people we want our children to model themselves after. Don't just do it for your kids. Do it for yourself. When you become a more self-aware, compassionate, and confident person, you and everyone around you benefit. For more information about me and my work, visit alishalyons.com. That's A-L-Y-S-I-A. L-Y-O-N-S dot com. See you next time.